so low as to use the very method that has perpetuated evil throughout our civilization. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm tired of the war in Vietnam. I'm tired of war and conflict in the world. I'm tired of shooting. I'm tired of hate. I'm tired of selfishness. I'm tired of evil. I'm not going to use violence no matter who says it. It's easy for us to blame this on Hoover. Uh, it's like if you and I sit and made a monster in the basement, and all at once we see this monster going out, destroying the neighborhood, and we want to say, oh, that monster, no, us. I mean, whether we like it or not, Hoover and the FBI and the CIA, they're the extension of us. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. What the media don't want to tell you about is that Martin Luther King in the last years of his life was a leading critic of U.S. foreign and economic policy. And in fact, at the time, in 1967, 68, the mainstream news media railed against Martin Luther King. A publication said he was speaking like he's a mouthpiece for Hanoi. He was viciously red-baited in the news media. It is my hope that power for poor people will really mean having the ability and the aggressiveness to make the power structure of this nation say yes when they may be desirous of saying no. We will get together and be together, black people, Mexican Americans, American Indians, Puerto Ricans, Appalachian whites, all working together to solve the problem of poverty. I think there's several reasons why the movement happened when it did. One reason is, is that it was the culmination of a whole series of struggles, legal, political, cultural, and social and economic. A movement which is to change the face of America begins when Rosa Parks, a black domestic worker, tired from a long day, refuses to relinquish her seat on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama. At the urging of E.D. Nixon, a young minister reluctantly agrees to lead a movement against a bus company and Jim Crow laws. The minister's name is Martin Luther King. King and his movement will go on to challenge all of segregation in the South. Initially, King will use a boycott to shut down the segregated bus line and a downtown business district vulnerable to black purchasing power. Martin fits in in several ways. He was the culmination of a protest movement that was just erupting in the Deep South. But Martin didn't create the movement. The movement created Martin. And by that I mean that Martin's brilliance was that he was a, a, a beautiful spokesperson for the frustrations, the latent anger, and the aspirations for successive generations of African-American people who had been denied the, the full uh, access to the American dream. King spoke in a sonorous, uh, religious voice, which was tied very closely to the culture of people who were struggling to be free. This morning, the long-awaited mandate from the United States Supreme Court concerning bus segregation came to Montgomery. This mandate expresses in terms that are crystal clear that segregation in public transportation is both legally and sociologically invalid. In the light of this mandate and the unanimous vote rendered by the Montgomery Improvement Association about a month ago, the year-old protest against city buses is officially called off and the Negro citizens of Montgomery are urged to return to the buses tomorrow morning. 
on a non-segregated basis. King's victory, inspired by Rosa Parks' bravery, leads to the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Led by young ministers, the group adopts the theories of Mahatma Gandhi, theories of non-violent civil disobedience. When SCLC began in 1957, Montgomery had already been operative for 375 or 60 days three, uh, over a year. So it gave people a sign and a symbol so there could be convergence, there could be people coming together from around the country uh, to focus in on that effort. But I think in saying that, I don't want to romanticize it because I think very clearly in this American climate, uh, teaching and practicing nonviolence and advocating nonviolence is very, very hard work. Well, in the very early years, uh, King sort of uh, erupts on the national scene with the Montgomery School boycott, and he's challenging the system of racial segregation in the South, and he's doing so in a more militant way than the NAACP, although the Bureau had, since the 1940s, been monitoring the NAACP. Uh, what's very interesting is before King becomes a major national figure in the 1960s, he finds himself on the Bureau's Reserve Index so that they saw him as an individual uh, who should be closely watched. After the McCarthy scare, J. Edgar Hoover had the country under control. There was no question here. He had all the progressive forces, the white progressive forces, running for cover, hiding everywhere, so he had nothing to worry about them. And out of nowhere, the people for whom he has the most racist contempt, they jump up and begin to put all this to rest. For 10 years, the FBI mounts a well-financed campaign to destroy Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Using its contacts and influence with the press, the federal agency involves the St. Louis Globe Democrat, the Atlanta Constitution, U.S. News and World Report, and Life magazine as part of an anti-King campaign. What's involved here is a quite different program than simply monitoring stories and re responding to critical stories, and it's an attempt to shape public opinion. And so that if there are individuals or organizations that you believe threaten the national security interests or you have doubts about, one thing to do is to create a negative press. And so that's what, what the Bureau did, and very purposefully in the case of King. Dr. King begins publicly to criticize the FBI, owing to the agency's unwillingness to transfer racist agents and its dereliction in protecting civil rights workers. Hoover, as well entrenched as any federal bureaucrat will ever become, considers the agency his personal fiefdom. Enraged by King's attacks, Hoover will call King the most notorious liar in America. Formerly based in the agency's Albany, Georgia office, FBI agent Arthur Murtaugh, testifying before a congressional committee, confirms Dr. King's criticisms. Referring to FBI bureaus, Murtaugh says, quote, their racial attitudes were the racial attitudes of the South in the pre-civil rights, pre-Brown decision times. Our feeling was that the, the FBI agent from the South was indistinguishable from his community. The FBI had to work with the local law enforcements. That was their task. So it was clear here, first of all, they, ha they have a comradeship from being in the same uh, type of job, law enforcement agencies, and uh, they were comrades from being in the South there together, not having too much work, joking together, and probably had social life together. And since the uh, local uh, police were the enemies were our enemies, and the FBI was supposed to be our allies, it meant an automatic split between them, which never occurred. Now, the other thing that we must see about this struggle is that, by and large, it has been a nonviolent struggle. Let nobody make you feel that those who are engaged or who are engaging in the demonstrations in communities all across the South are resorting to violence. These are few in number. But we've come to see the power of nonviolence. We've come to see that this method is not a weak method. For it's the strong man who can stand up amid opposition, who can stand up amid violence being inflicted upon him and not retaliate with violence. Yeah. 
In the early 1960s, Birmingham, Alabama was said to be one of the most racist cities in the U.S. Its mayor was Arthur Haynes, an attorney who would later defend James Earl Ray. Birmingham police official Bull Connor will initiate a reign of terror against the city's black citizens in a campaign of police-sponsored violence which will shock the nation and the world. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. Nor is this a partisan issue. In a time of domestic crisis, men of goodwill and generosity should be able to unite regardless of party or politics. This is not even a legal or legislative issue alone. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. Leaders in the movement, A. Philip Randolph, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Roy Wilkins, executive secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Walter Ruther of the AFL-CIO, and the Reverend Martin Luther King head the march down Constitution Avenue to the Lincoln Memorial. A parallel group proceeds down Independence Avenue to the south. This is no parade. There are plenty of placards, but few banners and no precision marching. There are no trumpets or drums, but there is almost overwhelming music. The sound of 200,000 voices joined in the battle hymn of the civil rights movement. We shall overcome. one of the foremost fighters for civil rights, is one of many speakers who remind the gathering that this march must not be counted a final victory or defeat, no matter what the immediate reaction of the members of Congress may be. At a White House meeting following the march, President Kennedy warns its leaders that strong bipartisan support will be necessary to get civil rights legislation passed this term. He adds that the orderly demonstration will advance the cause of 20 million Americans. And the gentle march has touched the hearts of millions more who perhaps for the first time can look to the fulfillment of the dreams that Dr. King shares with his people. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the 
sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. After the March on Washington and Dr. King's speech, the FBI intensifies its campaign against Dr. King. Assistant Director of the FBI, William Sullivan, concerned over J. Edgar Hoover's earlier reaction to a memo, which stated that there was no communist or subversive influence within the civil rights movement, now prepares a memo stating that Dr. King was, quote, the most dangerous man in the United States. It may be unrealistic to limit ourselves, as we have been doing, to legalistic proofs of definitely conclusive evidence, unquote. He was prepared to try to destroy anything he saw as disruptive to the social order of things. That he saw, you know, the, you know, in the early days, uh, the, uh, the mob as, you know, the, G, you know, the, the image of the G-men against the mob and so forth. And then later in terms of counterintelligence against foreign agents. And now in the 60s, something that he didn't understand, the thing, uh, the civil rights movement disrupting the social order of things, you use the same kind of tactics that you use against the mob and the people, foreign agents, as to citizens of the United States that, who were trying to get, you know, their civil rights and their civil liberties because they were all threats to the, the, the social order. And therefore, COINTELPRO came into being and he thought he had basically God on his side in direct violation of the United States Constitution. You have been forced to consider this legislation through the pressure and blackmail of mobs in the streets. The President of the United States and the Attorney General have encouraged demonstrations, freedom rides, sit-ins, picketing, and actual violations of local laws. It's in this context that Robert Kennedy first raises a question of uh, whether a wiretap could be installed on King's residence. And ultimately, in October of 63, Kennedy agrees. His authorization, however, is conditional. That is, that within a 30-day period, the Bureau should come back. And the strategy uh, seems to be that, okay, we will authorize within this time frame, you will pick up information. And I think his original interest was that if you tap King and you find no contact with subversive, quote, individuals, then it establishes you don't have subversive control. And so when he goes the second time to this limited authorization, it is to confine it in time. Nothing is uncovered. You're home free. If Southern Democrats say you're protecting King, you say, look, we authorize a tap of him. You do that, you know, silently. And we found nothing so that these allegations are unfounded. What does happen is that in November of 63, John Kennedy is assassinated, and Robert Kennedy forgets about his condition, and Hoover does not come back to him and say, look, you know, Mr. Attorney General, you asked us to come back in 30 days. Do you want us to continue the tap? And the King tap is only discovered by uh, Kennedy's successor, Nicholas Katzenbach, in 65. When news of Dr. King's Nobel Peace Prize reaches FBI Director Hoover, he is outraged and describes King to associates as, quote, one of the lowest characters in the country, unquote. Hoover's second-in-command, William Sullivan, authors an anonymous letter to King, urging that he kill himself. King, in view of your low grade, I will not dignify your name with either a mister or a reverend or a doctor, and your last name calls to mind only the type of King such as King Henry VIII. King, look into your heart, you know you are a complete fraud and a great liability to all of us Negroes. White people in this country have enough frauds of their own, but I am sure they don't have one at this time that is anywhere near your equal. You are no clergyman and you know it. I repeat, you are a colossal fraud and an evil vicious one at that. You could not believe in God. Clearly, you don't believe in any personal moral principles. King, like all frauds, your end is approaching. You could have been our greatest leader. You, even at an early age, have turned out to be not a leader, but a dissolute, abnormal moral imbecile. 
We will now have to depend on our older leaders like Wilkins, a man of character, and thank God we have others like him. But you are done. Your honorary degrees, your noble prize, what a grim farce, and other awards will not save you. King, I repeat, you are done. No person can overcome facts, not even a fraud like yourself. I repeat, no person can argue successfully against facts. You are finished. And some of them, to pretend to be ministers of the gospel, Satan could not do more. What incredible evilness. King, you are done. The American public, like church organizations that have been helping Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, will know you for what you are, an evil, abnormal beast. So will others who have backed you. You are done. King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. It has definite practical significance. You are done. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. We have no alternative but to keep moving with determination. We've gone too far now to turn back. And in a real sense, we are moving and we cannot afford to stop because Alabama and because our nation has a date with destiny. Selma, Alabama was an old southern town. Selma had been a slave market prior to the Civil War and a military depot at the time of the Confederacy. Martin Luther King calculates that because of its viciously racist sheriff, Jim Clark, and Clark's potential for overreaction, Selma, Alabama is the perfect location for the SCLC's campaign. True to form and King's insight, Clark shocks a watching nation and world by unleashing an unparalleled brutality on the helpless demonstrators. It would be detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly. This march will not continue. Troopers here advance toward the group. See that they disperse. we must let the world know that it is necessary to protest this threefold evil. The problem of the denial of the right to vote to police brutality that we continue to face and face in its most vicious form last Sunday. Then the attempt to block First Amendment privilege. We have the right to walk the highway we have the right to walk to Montgomery if our feet can get us there. This is Mr. C.M. Rhodes, minister of the Selma Avenue Church of Christ, on the occasion of the Selma to Montgomery March. You've seen the civil rights movement in Selma, Mr. Rhodes, in the past nine weeks. Will there be any good from the demonstration march that is now in progress? Well, in one sense, I think there will be good. I think it will awake the, nit the uh, nation manifest of what is really behind it and the complex issues that are involved, the communist infiltration and a number of other factors. So I think there will good come from it even though the, there is a great deal of agitation and quite a mess as it is. You've seen it transpire over the past nine weeks here in Selma. Just what have you seen? Well, I've seen communism in action. I've seen exploitation of boys and girls who should have never been taken out of the schools. I've seen false promises made on the part of the civil rights leader. I've seen the Negro himself being used as a pawn and as a tool by this conspiracy. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause 
must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. That period of, of being, of, of, of getting, and when you consider the number of, of black people living in the South without the right to vote, and some of the few who did were told how to vote. And then even after the Voting Rights Act, uh, that one, they, they came up with all kind of schemes to deny. It was a terribly significant moment in, in, in the movement. Beyond that, we are still the last tide and the first five. So what we've got to see is that the things that are being done in such a creative manner by you will make Birmingham a better city for everybody. Sparked by a case of police brutality, the Watts Rebellion in Los Angeles changes the course of the civil rights movement. Any social movement that reaches its basic objectives, the question then arises, what next? And Martin began to ponder this question as early as 1964, and certainly by the uh, march, the Selma march from in early 1965, Martin began to question this. It's not just a question of opportunity. It's not just a question of fairness, the way the liberals define it. It's also a question of how do you realize true human justice? How do you empower those who are oppressed? If you gain access to a lunch counter and you can drink a cup of coffee there, what good does it do if you have no money in your pocket? A movement takes time to develop. You, you can't jump from A to Z in one leap when you're talking about a society and a community and social and political economic issues that you have to, to um, confront. So uh, that took us time. A lot of the folk who were in the 60s, uh, early 60s, were people who were committed to a nonviolent perspective in terms of race, but were not committed to a nonviolent perspective in terms of Vietnam. Make no mistake about the character of this war. Our adversaries have done us at least one great service. They have described this war for what it is in unmistakable terms. It is meant to be the opening salvo in a series of bombardments, or as they are called in Peking, wars of liberation. And if it succeeds in South Vietnam, then, as Marshal Lin Pao says, and I quote him, the people in other parts of the world will see that what the Vietnamese people can do, they can do too. As long as King focused his struggles for empowerment, 
and reform to the African American community. And as long as he talked in terms of race, then King might be a thorn in the side of the FBI and he might be a problem for the Johnson administration to a limited degree. But he really did not pose a fundamentally radical challenge to the system of power. But when King took up the question after the passage and ratification of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, he took up the question of America's involvement in the war in Vietnam and how billions of dollars was being spent abroad that we needed for domestic reconstruction at home. When he took up the issue of poor people's rights, the need not just to have a, a right to vote, but a human right to a job. That homelessness should be abolished. Everyone should have clean, affordable shelter. That education should be free and available to all, not just public schools, but university education. That we do something about the great inequalities of wealth and power and privilege, which are structurally uh, stratified within the society. When King began to talk this way, that's when he posed a threat to the system. What Hoover does is, not only in the case of King, but other critics of the war, is send on these reports. Um, and the, the White House specifically requested, in the midst of, the, of this very deep political crisis, that the FBI share information with members of Congress that challenged the loyalty of the administration's anti-war critics, so that the, the Bureau was doing that at the request of the White House. Uh, it, 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 that was a problem for, for Hoover to do that because I think he shared uh, not necessarily Johnson's political interests but his ideological orientation and the attempt to discredit the militant civil rights and anti-war movements. Bill Moyers, when he was a leading, uh, a leading White House aide in the LBJ administration, was one of the individuals that circulated a monograph which was full of red baiting material about Martin Luther King that turns out now to be totally scurrilous, uh, suggesting that this great intellectual was a dupe of Moscow and that this white former communist sympathizer was leading him around by the nose. I mean, it's, it's vicious racism and this monograph was just scurrilous and like many of the uh, White House aides, uh, Walter Jenkins was in on it, uh, Bill Moyers and others were circulating this material throughout the government and this material was also sent to journalists. And I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against it not in anger but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart and above all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. There can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. King's growing opposition to the Vietnam War is causing him considerable trouble. A siege attitude develops at the White House, creating an aura of paranoia. John P. Roach, an advisor to President Lyndon Johnson, in a memo describes Dr. King, quote, King, in desperate search for a constituency, has thrown in with the commies. The civil rights movement is shot, and King, who is inordinately ambitious and quite stupid, is destroying his reputation and painting himself into a corner, unquote. The Washington Post criticized King by saying that his objections to the war were sheer inventions and unsupported fantasy. Life magazine called King's remarks demagogic slander that sounded like a script for Radio Hanoi. Black columnist Carl Rowan, former director of the CIA-linked U.S. Information Agency, attacks King and questions whether he was receiving his information from communists. By that time, King was a very, very influential American figure. I mean, he had moved beyond the civil rights movement to become an American figure. And so when he spoke to that issue, I mean, he brought the church community along with him. He brought the liberal community along with him. He brought the young people along with him. He brought the black community along with him. And for Johnson to have somebody with that moral authority speaking in, that, in the community, he had, to, he had to go after me. Johnson went after King. There was a counter-revolution in the country, so to speak. The 
the public opinion had turned around against the Vietnam War. You had peaceful demonstrations, I mean, not, I mean you had anti-war demonstrations uh, all over the country on college campuses. You had Dr. King now joining not just civil rights demonstrations, but he held probably the largest uh, uh, anti-Vietnam peaceful demonstration in New York City and off down Fifth Avenue, one of the biggest. And I think there were a lot of concern among what had been called the so-called paranoid patriots that saw that were so pro-Vietnam war that they saw any type of dissent as treason. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover put it in perspective when he said, in his testimony before the House Appropriations Committee in 1962, since its inception, the Communist Party USA has been alert on every possible issue or event which could be used to exploit the American Negro in furtherance of party aims. Moscow's former top representative in America, John Porgeny, quotes the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin. It is the basic duty of the Communist Party to develop all revolutionary possibilities of the Negro race, to transform the Solid South and the Black Belt from reserve forces of the bourgeoisie to reserve forces for the proletariat. Stalin's image of the southern states makes them a solid coalition for oppressing and suppressing the Negroes living within their borders. In the summer of 1967, American cities erupt in flames. For the past two years, violence has become a part of the American urban landscape. By 1967, first Newark, New Jersey, and then Detroit, Michigan, have seen significant civil disturbances. FBI and CIA sources are convinced that the urban disturbances are the work of communists. If you look at the Civil Rights Coalition, what you see is not a monolithic organization, but a united front of progressive groups, of progressive as well as kind of moderate groups. On the right, you had the Urban League, which was a civil rights organization, but essentially pursued a strategy of coalitions with capital and working cordially with big business to try to set up job opportunities and social welfare reform and housing reform for blacks moving to the cities. To the Urban League's left, but still on the right end of the spectrum, was the NAACP. It had a legalistic strategy for social change, used the courts. In the center, you had the SCLC. It used nonviolent direct action social change, Gandhian techniques. To their left would be CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, for a while founded, led by uh, people like James Farmer and Baird Rustin and later by Floyd McKissick and Roy Innes. Finally, on the far left, you had, of course, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. If you want to disrupt a broad united front of organizations from the right to the left and then the center, where do you attack it? You attack it right in the middle. And what do you do? You attack the person who is most charismatic and most influential in the center. King was at the center of the center of a broad array of movements. If you, replay, if you take him out, in effect, you take out the, the key that holds the wheel onto the wagon, and the whole wheel falls off. If you remove him, you don't only remove a sharp critic of the system, but what you do is you create a pressure in the center forcing collapse. Now, if we can figure this out, don't you think the FBI can figure it out? We must prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Malcolm X might have been such a messiah. He is the martyr of the movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. King could be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrines, nonviolence, and embrace black nationalism. Carmichael has the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. They go talking about these little uh, levels of progress that we see here and there, and they say, you know, you've made great progress. Aren't you satisfied? No, we are not satisfied. We will not be satisfied. 
As long as Negro boys and Negro girls are forced to live life without dignity and without respect, we will not be satisfied. Having long spoken of a poor people's alliance, King now puts his words into action. Poor people would descend on the nation's capital, vowing not to leave until something was done about the racial and class biases that dominate parts of the U.S. The Johnson White House, furious with King, demands that the FBI's number two man, Cartha Deloach, keep them informed of King's plans. Their method will be informants and surveillance. The FBI will reply, quote, based on King's recent activities and public utterances, it is clear that he is an instrument in the hands of subversive forces seeking to undermine our nation. When Martin Luther King uh, in 1967 started talking about Poor People's March and bringing people together the summer of 1968, he suddenly lost the halo because it did not matter about him leading black people up and down the street. The white establishment could deal with that because that was a segmented approach to solving the problem. And they also knew that there were significant numbers of black people that they could buy off across the country. Uh, elected officials, uh, this kind of thing, so that they could blunt the thrust of what King was doing. But at the point that they came up with the idea of the Poor People's March and they started talking about Hispanic people, uh, black people, low-income white people, ethnics were involved. Uh, a tremendous coalition that status quo people never want to see come together in this country. And as a consequence, King became in the eyes of these very fanatical people, he became dangerous. I mean, it's some heavy stuff. You're talking about redistributing the wealth of this nation. And we couldn't believe our government would do the kinds of things in those days that they were doing. You know, we knew it because it was happening to us. But you couldn't get news people or anybody to believe, you know, until they started mining in the harbors in Nicaragua and doing th and, and CIA killing people and stuff. But you just America, Americans wouldn't do that. So you said, oh, America, you, you, they wouldn't kill a black leader. Right, okay. In 1967, James Earl Ray escaped from Jefferson State Penitentiary in Missouri. His first stop is Chicago, where he works as a dishwasher. He soon flees to Canada, where he claims to meet a man who would only identify himself as Raoul. Ray begins to work for Raoul, carrying contraband. Raoul provides Ray with money in exchange for Ray's help. Ray, a wanted fugitive, is hopeful that Raoul will provide him with a new identity and a passport. James O'Ray, Ray, in his own book, Tennessee Waltz, uh, names the person that introduced him to this shadowy figure, Raoul, as David Gravier. And David Gravier, interestingly enough, is a director in a financial operation, a bank, a specific bank, um, that is financially tied and founded under Credit Suisse. Uh, and Credit Suisse uh, is, is the financing arm for many international intelligence operations, including, most importantly, being the financial base uh, for a firm called Permanent Industrial Exhibits, or Permindex which is named by many of the Kennedy researchers uh, as, as one of the firms operating on a level of the mechanics and placing the assassins uh, in the John F. Kennedy assassination.
getting ready to demand jobs and income. We are tired of working full-time jobs for part-time income. We are tired of living in run-down, dilapidated, rat-infested shacks and slums. We are tired of our children having to attend overcrowded, inferior schools. Memphis is sort of seen as an aberration and is not seen as an integral part of the movement up to that time. I, I, I've long recognized that from many, many different directions because it was a strike and it was workers and workers at the bottom. Well, the sanitation department, the public works department, uh, was 100% black. Uh, it, it was low paid. It was unskilled. It was made up uh, to a large extent of older men. Uh, they were men who had worked in the public works department for a very, very long time. There had been attempts to organize for five years prior to 1968. A, uh, a sanitation worker named T.O. Jones, who was really the, the unsung hero of the early strike, uh, T.O. Jones began to try to organize for various reasons. Their petitions fell on deaf ears from the mayor to the person in charge of public works to the city council. The working conditions, um, for instance, at various times there was no workman's compensation, so if you hurt your back picking up garbage, and in the early days, of course, they were throwing garbage cans around and throwing them onto the truck, there was no workman's compensation. Uh, the salary was quite low. There were very, very few benefits and nothing seemed to be getting any better. And we just got tired. We had meetings and discussed it and says, uh, we're going to do something about it. Tell them but one thing to do is just to uh, make our move. And it was people that had, that had large families and everything, and to make up their mind to go out there. And uh, you know, a um, man has got to have a strong mind to go out in the street leave his job and go out in the street. We felt like we would have to let the city know that because we were sanitation workers, we were human beings. The signs that we were carrying said that I am a man and we was going to demand to have the same dignity and the same courtesy any other citizen of Memphis has. It has been held that all employees of a municipality may not strike for any purpose. This, of course, includes employees of the Public Works Department. This is not New York, and nothing will be gained by ignoring our laws. They tagged Henry Loeb throughout the strike with, with the plantation owner mentality. And indeed, Henry Loeb was that. Uh, it was the old idea that, that if our boys are having trouble, uh, then we go and talk to our boys and we solve their little problems for them and our boys fall back into line. Uh, what shocked Henry almost from the beginning was that the boys didn't fall back into line. Uh, enough has never been said about the courage of the individual sanitation workers here in that strike. These were uneducated, unskilled, low-paid men who scrabbled for every bit that they could get. Uh, they went out on strike fearfully, uh, their families even more fearful, I think. There were no benefits. There were, well, there were some benefits for the union, but very, very few benefits. And uh, somehow they had the backbone to stay together and hold out. If work is not resumed by 7 a.m. Thursday, we will immediately begin doing our duty by replacing these people who have chosen to abandon their jobs and their rights. When a public official orders a group of men to get back to work and then we'll talk and treats them as though they are not men, that's a racist point of view. And no matter how you dress it up in terms of whether or not a union can organize, it's still racism. For at the heart of racism is the idea that a man is not a man, that a person is not a person. There had been a meeting downtown at the auditorium of uh, strikers and their supporters. And at that point, that was early on in the strike, 
and uh, there were a few black ministers in, but there weren't terribly many black ministers in yet. Uh, the city council had just rejected uh, the plea for uh, some kind of negotiated settlement, and that was announced to the crowd. And the people at the meeting were, were uh, kind of upset, so they asked for and got permission to march back to one of the black churches, march downtown. We were marching peacefully down the streets, and one police was in a car. And uh, Miss Crenshaw, one of the ladies was with us. The man run the car up on a hill. He bumped a hill two or three times. So T.O. Jones says, Mr. Officer, don't run up and bump the lady's hill with that car. And so he did it again. And that's what started the maze. I don't know who it was. Somebody hollered, said, break it up. And it just broke right on us. And honest for God in heaven, I got my suit at home right now I had on. And smell it. it you can smell it. Them many years, now I won't put it on. And they sprayed so much that stuff down my collar until I could feel it look like running down my back. That was the turning point because at that point the black ministers got up and they said, if in the city of Memphis black ministers can be maced with impunity, then no one is safe. King wanted to be there and did not see it as an accident. His only reservations were about how to do it with the very tight schedule in March that was already formulated and very hard nose how to do it in the light of his schedule in March and how soon he could do it. This strike and the killing of Dr. Keynes, it's a very short period of time. I mean, we're really talking about two months. All this is happening within two months. It's hap it happens very quickly. The polarization happens terribly quickly. Uh, Dr. King is brought in uh, because the strike needs outside support. Uh, you have to remember where we were in, in February of 68 was the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, for one thing. So it looked like the Vietnamese War was, going to, was just up for grabs at that point. And all the talk about we were going to win in Vietnam was, was down the drain. Uh, Johnson would withdraw from the presidency right before Dr. King was killed. Bobby Kennedy comes into the race. There's the release on the uh, report on causes of violence in the United States comes in in that period. So all these things are happening in the country. And down in Memphis, you have this, what was evidently termed by the national media as this kind of piddly little strike going on. So they needed outside, the strike leaders realized that they needed outside uh, support. When a movement was going in a certain town, you would get maybe lesser known people to come in and have a rally than better known people to have a rally. But the ultimate was always to get Martin King to come in and rally. And that's what happened in Memphis. And he came against the advice of all of his, all of his staff because they, we we organizing the Poor People's Campaign and we don't have time to go to Memphis. He said, but that's what the campaign's about, you know. Here again, economic justice. These men worked all week long under the most horrendous conditions you can imagine and still qualified for welfare, most of them, because they made so little, making 50 cents an hour, 40 cents an hour. If it rained, they didn't work. They had no bathroom privileges, no facilities. Uh, it, was, it was two steps above slavery. You are demanding that this city will respect the dignity of labor. So often, we overlook the worth and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that whenever you are engaged in work, that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and it has worth. Yeah. All labor has dignity. Yeah. But you are doing another thing. You are reminding not only Memphis, 
But you are reminding the nation that it is a crime for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. He came into Memphis that night and it was almost like, uh, oh, maybe like Montgomery. The kind of simplicity of it. Here were a guy. Here were guys. Here were sanitation workers who certainly had a just cause. If there were ever a just cause, it was that sanitation strike. Here was a clear-cut, simple, just cause, and these were his people. And so, when he finished speaking, a note was slipped to him asking if he'd come back. And he got back up on the podium and said he was willing to come back and lead a march. And the place went wild. His staff were appalled. His staff people were appalled that he had committed to coming back to Memphis because they didn't want him to do that. Uh, he came back in then on March the 28th, and that was when we had the mini riot here. Uh, the march was broken up, and then King was real. Dr. King was really caught at that point because now, all over the country, the national media are saying. If he can't even lead a piddly march in Memphis, Tennessee, are we going to let him come to Washington? Long an FBI sounding board, the St. Louis Globe Democrat accuses King of plotting a new race war. By 1968, the FBI has logged over 50 death threats directed at Dr. King. The events involving security for Dr. King raise many troubling questions. Some evidence indicates that King's movements were being manipulated through FBI COINTELPRO style maneuvers. Martin Luther King never stayed at the Lorraine Hotel. He always stayed at the Holiday Inn, where the security uh, was, was better. We know now that it was J. Edgar Hoover who dropped the, to the press on which they was running uh, the great black leader that say, don't do as I do, do as I say do. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is telling black folks to Negroes to barcott white businesses, and yet he's staying at the Holiday Inn. And it was that that embarrassed him into moving to the Lorraine Hotel. Now, a very interesting thing. King was on the first floor. They said a light-complected Negro came in, and we know now it was white, who worked for King, who worked for SELC, so they were told, and said, look, uh, don't put him there, put him up there. Now, we know all of this happened. The tactical units that would have been surrounding King under any normal circumstance at that point and would have prevented the escape of any assassin, uh, all, all the tactical units in that area were drawn back that morning. And, uh, and we're operating several blocks away instead of right in the vicinity of King. And the change in hotels, where King moved from the white to the black hotel there at the Lorraine, even the change of rooms, which was arranged at the last minute to put him up on the second floor balcony, all suggest a level of planning much beyond anything that, that a lone assassin could have done. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. That night was, was really quite mystical. Uh, for a lot of us. And, and for him, it was almost like a cleansing, a purging. He went through some things that we'd not necessarily seen him go through. Like he dwelt on the time the lady stabbed him in New York. 
and he got a letter saying that uh, from a young little girl that said, uh, I'm glad that the New York Times said if, if Dr. King had sneezed, the letter opener would have punctured the aorta and he would have drowned in his own blood. And the little girl said, Dear Dr. King, I'm worried about your misfortune. And uh, if you had sneezed, you would have drowned in your blood. I'm glad you didn't sneeze. And he picked up on that and said, I'm glad I didn't sneeze. If I'd sneezed, I would have missed the Selma and Montgomery March. I'm glad I didn't sneeze. I would have. And he just did a whole litany on events in his life that he would have missed had he sneezed. And he dwelt on that. He never, I, I, don't, ever, I don't think I've ever heard him do that before. And then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats. I talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. Yeah. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. Oh, hey. And I've looked over. Oh, hey. And I've seen the promised land. Yeah. I may not get there with you. Yeah. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Go ahead, go ahead. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And the day of his assassination, I mentioned to Andy, I said, Andy, they are giving Martin's room number on the radio and television because I kept hearing Dr. King is back in town to lead a march. He's in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel. Well, you just don't do that, which means that somebody had put it on the teletype and every news person that came in to read it read that copy. Dr. King is back in Memphis in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel. And it was on, I said, I said Andy, we need to get that checked. He said, okay, yeah, we do but we never did. Ray's story was that he came to Memphis. He said he stayed at the Rebel Motel, that he was not John Willard, he did not rent the room from Bessie Brewer, and that he met Rao at the Rebel Motel the night before, uh, Rao, uh, and that Rao was John Willard, that Rao had, was gonna rent this room, contact Ray the next day, and meet him at the rooming house. Somebody was moving Ray, somebody was handling Ray, and on instruction, uh, got into the area around the rooming house, but was not in the rooming house by his own uh, story, and that's corroborated by other witnesses, but was in fact about a half mile away changing a tire in a car around 6 o'clock, which is the time of the King shooting. So none of the things work uh, in terms of Ray being the assassin or being in the rooming house. He is, like Oswald, another patsy set up. Well, so what happened the last hour of King's life? It's like three news people in a room, in a hotel room, waiting to go to dinner. You talk about news stuff. It was three preachers in a room talking about preachers' stuff, talking about revival. I had to preach revival. Ralph Abernathy needed somebody to preach revival. Marge said, why don't you get Kyle to do it? He said, yeah, Kyle, what you doing? I said, I got to go to Columbus, Georgia for Fred Lofton, who pastors here now. He said, Martin said, man, anybody with good sense would rather spend a week in Atlanta than go to Columbus, Georgia. He said, but who said you had good sense, you know, in a good mood, good mood. Uh, he said, now, if you, we're going to your house for dinner. I said, yeah. He said, now, Ralph said, I know your wife didn't cook because she's too pretty. Then uh, somebody said, uh, Martin said, well, it was just that kind of banter between preachers. He said, tell me, what do you think it was, Billy, that, that galvanized this community behind the, the sanitation workers? He said, Man, this is a movement. This is really a movement. Then finally, about a quarter of six, we're on the porch, on the balcony, 
and there were some people out there, and he greeted them, and Jesse was down there, he greeted him, and uh, somebody said, go back, Ralph was in the room putting on cologne. He said, there's going to be some pretty ladies there, so I'm going to smell good. Martin, somebody hauled up and said, Martin, it's going to be chilly, bring your coat. So he, he told Ralph, get my coat. Martin stood here and I stood here. He leaned over the balcony, was talking to Jesse at the very moment of the impact. I stood, I said, okay guys, let's go. I got about right here. Paya. I didn't realize it was a shot until I looked over the railing and people were ducking. One shot. I looked back and Martin was mortally wounded. Go back to the person that shot King. They ran through the flop house and looked the old, poor, snaggletooth white lady in the face named Grace Stevens. Well, she was the one in the open in the room with the door open in the hallway. She's the one who saw um, the person come out of the bathroom and run down the step after she heard the shot. Um, She's the one who was showing pictures later on and, was, and said, no, this is not the man I said. She described the man so that there are at least two descriptions of the man, the one that fits the person she saw and the one that fits James Earl uh, Ray. Then when she would not yield, they took the drunk husband, the drunk common law, law husband as the one who had been the witness. And of course, he had seen nothing. They put words into his mouth and got him to give the description that they gave. And then, uh, in order as, as though to protect themselves, they saw to it that Grace uh, got confined to a, a mental hospital as mentally incompetent. And 10 years after being in that nut house, when some decent folks decided to run and steal her out, when they crawled next to her bed in the middle of the morning, she never knew it was good people. She thought it was the same government people. And when they shined that light in her face, she said, I tell you now what I told you then, that's not the man. And the most mighty government in the world could not make her lie and say it was James O. Ray. There wasn't any attempt uh, to really try to place Ray. The witnesses in the situation did not identify the person who rented the room in the boarding house as Ray. I went into that boarding house. The physical condition of the boarding house is such that you couldn't get a shot off from that window. The window was almost completely closed. It's directly above a bathtub. To shoot out of it, you'd have to stand in the bathtub and then crouch down. In order to move the rifle in such a way that it would come anywhere near King, you'd have to be a left-handed person and your left elbow would have to be punched into the wall of the bathroom. There is evidence of three people using the room, one of whom stays in the bathroom, a second person in the room, I believe, with these binoculars that were found in the package, watching for King to come out, probably in radio contact with each other, but basically sighters, not shooters, and a third actual shooter down below who then aims at King uh, from directly across the street behind the bushes and is seen by several witnesses. He even kicks one guy, uh, uh, Cornbread Carter, who's sleeping off a, uh, an alcoholic uh, drunk, um, you know, the, the, there in the, in the bushes, and he wakes him up, and this guy sees him, uh, you know, dissemble the gun and, and jump over the retaining wall. Several witnesses saw him jump off the retaining wall and meld into the crowd and then get on a scooter and one of the cop cars tried to follow him out but couldn't get through the crowd. Following the assassination, James Earl Ray states that he picked up Raul at the Main Street rooming house, dropped him off, and then drove all night to Atlanta, Georgia. Ray then takes a Greyhound bus to Toronto, Canada. Previously, Ray had stated that he did not return to Atlanta. Ray is his own worst enemy by varying his stories. And he told me he did not return to Atlanta the next day after the assassination. Where did he say when? Didn't say.
they weren't looking for a conspiracy. And that leads us to the question of Arthur Murtaugh. Uh, Arthur Murtaugh was an FBI agent in good standing. He retired after about 20 years in the Bureau, uh, became a pr practicing lawyer in upstate New York. And he said, I was involved in the assassination investigation. I saw what happened. The FBI wasn't even looking for a conspiracy. He said the FBI systematically washed out conspiracy leads that would have pointed toward the right wing. And Arthur Murtaugh talked about something else. He said, on the day of the assassination, he watched as a supervisor in the Atlanta FBI office at hearing the news that King had been shot, began jumping up and down in glee. They finally shot the son of a bitch. They finally shot Zorro. Zorro was the FBI's code name for Martin Luther King. So you have to say that FBI was inept too from the very beginning <laughs> in the matter, at the very least. Yes, I've uh, always been very suspicious of, it, of the whole business. There was a gun that was used, however, um, it was found uh, outside uh, the rooming house from which the shots were allegedly fired. Um, and uh, it's fi uh, found with a pile of uh, other items traceable to James Earl Ray in a blanket uh, left outside Knipe's amusement house. Why leave a whole package of evidence behind to trace you directly to the trial? A gun that you've bought, you know, and have a record of its purchase in a store, uh, a, pr a prison radio. I mean, things were there that belonged to Ray, but there were clothes that wouldn't have fit him. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a ridiculous thing for somebody who's actually committing a crime uh, to do, to leave this whole package of evidence like a Christmas present behind uh, for the Memphis police and the FBI to eventually link back to his name. It's my belief that rather than indicating uh, Ray's guilt, that indicates the contrary, uh, because I cannot think of anyone uh, who would be stupid enough to leave the evidence against him on the street outside of the rooming house in which he was only uh, shortly before the assassination. They never conducted, well, at that time, the most sophisticated test in the state of art at that time was uh, a spectrographic analysis test. The FBI didn't conduct that test. They could actually have conducted such a test and take the fragments from Dr. King's neck, conducted a test, and linked it with the rifle. They did not do that. Mr. Fraser testified, yes, the, the bullets found in the bundle was consistent with the fragments, Dr. King, that not conclusive, but you see, that type of reasoning is sure that it would be also consistent with with uh, ma ammunition manufactured years before, years after. I mean, it, it was no evidence at all. They, they, there were no there was no ballistic evidence that could link that rifle with Dr. King's. There are many other indications that Ray, especially in the in the situation in Toronto, uh, had connections with U.S. intelligence in terms of how he was being moved and manipulated and did things that were well beyond his capability. For instance, he used aliases of three different people who lived near each other in Toronto who looked exactly like him almost, uh, one to the extent that he had the same facial scars uh, and wounds. What's the, could he go to a phone book and pick out people that live so close to each other randomly? Uh, it just made no sense. Ray, traveling under one of his Toronto aliases, Raymond Snade, made his escape to London, England, where it seems that he lost his contact and reverted to his bungling ways and was finally apprehended by Scotland Yard at Heathrow International Airport. Ray was trying to escape to Rhodesia at the time the U.S. government was faced with a curious dilemma in the extradition of James Earl Ray. To win custody, American authorities must first produce evidence sufficient to warrant trial under British law. It is interesting to note that the U.S. sought extradition of James Earl Ray on conspiracy charges to the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. The Justice Department initially filed uh, a, a uh, charge against James Earl Ray in Birmingham, in federal court in Birmingham, alleging that uh, uh, he had been part of a conspiracy to assassinate Dr. King. Um, years later, when uh, Bud Fensterwald and I represented Ray, um, we filed a motion uh, asking that he be brought to trial on that charge, uh, hoping that we could smoke the government out. Uh, instead, the government simply moved to dismiss the, uh, the charge, and the charge was dropped. So all of these things are suspicious things. James Earl Ray being caught 
and then put in a special cell uh, where he claims he was sick. I remember that on the front pages of the paper, his petition and the judge to change some of the lights, to change his conditions because he was getting sick. Then a well-known defense lawyer in the country coming into the state of Tennessee and claiming, James L. Ray, you will be executed if you do not plead guilty. There had been no executions in the state of Tennessee by that time for at least 16 years. In uh, 1969, as the uh, new trial date uh, neared, um, Ray says that Foreman uh, began to coerce him uh, into pleading guilty, began to pressure him to plead guilty, and ultimately threatened that if he did not uh, plead guilty, that uh, Foreman would withdraw from the case and allow Ray to go to trial with a public defender. Ray thought that that would be absolutely disastrous because he knew that public defenders did not have a very good reputation, did not have the skills, resources, or experience to do the kind of job his case required. So he reasoned that it would be better to plead guilty and then try to overturn the guilty plea rather than to go to trial with a public defender. Although Ray had pleaded guilty at an earlier hearing, he interrupts his attorney, Foreman, when Foreman maintains to the court that there was no conspiracy. Ray later states, I was a setup and sucked in. I bought the rifle that was found on the sidewalk after the murder, but I did not fire at King or anybody else. Over time, with the release of the documents and with careful study of the volumes, the critics have found that this was almost as flawed an investigation as the original uh, Warren Commission work had been in the John F. Kennedy case. And there were no real efforts to uh, to determine anything except a rather vague implication that Ray might have been involved with some conspiracy where someone was putting up money to have King killed and feeling that he could cash in, he went to be the lone assassin. That investigation was a complete sham. The FBI, certain FBI officials were happy that King was dead and they didn't give a damn who had killed him. And that's what, that's why the real villain here isn't the FBI. They, they were known to hate civil rights activists, peace activists. They were a, a weapon against uh, the progressive movement in this country in the broadest sense for 50 years under J. Edgar Hoover. That's a given. The real villains here, in my view, are the media and the Democratic Party and the members of Congress. In April 1968, when Martin Luther King was killed, not one of them spoke out and said, wait a second. Given what the FBI did to Martin Luther King in the last five years of his life, we can't let them head the investigation. We need some independent body. We need a special prosecutor, or we need to set up a special committee of Congress to watchdog the FBI's investigation, or something's got to be done. But we can't let an agency that had made Martin Luther King public enemy number one, we can't let that agency be the investigators of who killed King. That would be criminal. And where was the U.S. Congress? Because the U.S. Congress knew damn well what the FBI had done to King during King's life, and they didn't lift a finger. They were intimidated and afraid of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI czar.
Don't tell me Negro, that's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? What tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? Yes, How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb yes, sir. as you are right now? To kill the brother because he had began to take meaningful steps toward gaining the freedom for his people. He was taking steps to internationalize the black man's struggle and to take it to the United Nations, to take it diplomatically to the other countries around the world so that meaningful pressure could be brought to bear on the United States government and to force them to let his people go. We can't. Because he had began to take meaningful steps towards gaining the freedom for his people. He was taking steps to internationalize the black man's struggle and to take it to the United Nations to take it diplomatically to the other countries around the world so that meaningful pressure could be brought to bear on the United States government and to force them to let his people go. We can't. Because he had began to take meaningful steps toward gaining the freedom for his people. He was taking steps to internationalize the black man's struggle and to take it to the United Nations, to take it diplomatically to the other countries around the world so that meaningful pressure could be brought to bear on the United States government and to force them to let his people go. We can't prove for sure. To the people of America and the nations of the world that we are not about to turn around. Yes, sir. We are on the move now. Yes, sir. Yes, we are on the move and no wave of racism can stop us. Yes, sir. And the burning of our churches will not deter us. Yes, the bombing of our homes will not dissuade us. Yes, the beating and killing of our clergymen and young people will not 